Hey everyone, welcome to part two of Project Cobalt. This part of the build log is going to be all about the modding. So starting right from where we left off, we were about to do the case mod for the Fractal Kelvin S24. I've taken the step of breaking down the case to its individual pieces very early in the process. It's something that would normally be done later after a lot more planning and modding. Well, this is because I'm actually a lot further ahead when it comes to what I've visualized for the mods and what I have planned than what I've talked about in the video. And it's something that you'll catch up on as we go. But still, I am going to have to put the case back together, well, at least two times to get more measurements, to visualize more, but it's really no big deal, mainly with a small case like this. You know, it's very easy to quickly reassemble it, maybe put in a couple of rivets to just hold it there while you're doing some measurements. Now I had to remove the tape that I already had so that I can see the shape of the mid plate because the shape of the mid plate is going to define where I'm actually going to end up cutting it. Because I want to get rid of as much of the mess as I can, the existing holes and shapes and everything, but I can't take away too much where I'm going to lose strength. Because what I'd like to do is go all the way out to you know, this line here, but then I'm not going to have enough to bolt the new panel onto and it's going to start to become weak. So. I'm actually going to leave this recess here. It'll create a nice border, a bit more detail and shape, and certainly a lot more strength. And you know, it'll give me a comfortable area to be able to bolt onto. For the top panel, I'm just going to cut out the entire recessed section, and then I'm going to bolt a new panel straight on the top. So I don't need to mark anything out because I can just follow this line that is already here. And I'm not going to mask it up because if I do, I'm not going to be able to see that line properly. So I'll leave that one. The front panel, I'm going to leave this entire back section. I need to leave these three holes because they're structural. That's for mounting the mid plate. But pretty much all of this can go for the fan and radiator mounting. Now I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to go up here because I need to leave as much of this top part as possible. And some of it I need to mark out, some of it I don't. If I can follow, you know, cut along the lines of some of the existing shape, which is what I do a lot of the time, then I don't need to mask up at all. I'm going to follow that line there. For this sort of thing, cutting up case panels, I either use a Dremel or a jigsaw. And I usually prefer to use a jigsaw whenever I can because it's quicker and easier. And you know, with a Dremel you go through a lot of blades. You could also use a small angle grinder. You're probably thinking, why haven't I clamped it down? Well, if you take a look at the shape of the panel, it's not going to be that easy to clamp it. And most of the time, I don't need to. And to speed things up, if I can get away just holding it, not clamping it, then I will. This one might be easier with the Dremel because of the shape, but just wait until you see how slow it is and then you'll realize why I like to use the jigsaw. The Dremel is actually cutting unexpectedly quickly and it's because of how thin this steel is. I'm not sure if it's thinner than what I'm actually used to, but it seems to be. Now you might be able to see this here, 
that's really not that good. I'm going to have to do a fair bit of sanding to get rid of that. I should have masked all the way up to the line where I'm cutting to prevent that. It's just that if you do that, Sometimes it prevents you from actually seeing where you need to cut if you accidentally mask just a little bit over. But actually, you can use the masking tape to get your line if you pull it really straight. Some people do that, but I don't like to because if you twist your hands a little bit, it just changes the whole line of the masking tape and you, know, you end up getting wrong measurements. Moving on to the front panel, and the Dremel's going well, so I'm going to keep using it. It's either the blades have improved or the material is thinner than what I'm used to because it's cutting quite quickly. And the key when you're using a Dremel is to keep the blade as cool as possible. When it heats up too much, it just eats away the blade and it doesn't cut very efficiently. I've finished removing the material that I don't need from the top panel, front panel, and the motherboard tray, the mid panel. And it's now time to clean them up. And for this, I use a file. Now, what I do, I normally get most of my lines perfect by eye with the file, but what you can do to help, if you can't get it perfect by eye, is just keep running a ruler down the line, and then you can see where the high spots are. And you know, once you remove the ruler, you can still see where they are and then you can go back and hit them with the file and just keep doing that until you get it perfect. You can also measure off, you know, to make sure that you're not on a big angle. Now for the last panel, which is the front panel, and there's really not much left of this one, so I'm going to have to be careful. But it does still have a lot of strength because it's quite a thick panel with a lot of folds. But it doesn't matter because we're going to be putting another panel straight over the top of this one and bolting it to it, which is going to give it plenty of strength. It's taken me over an hour to straighten up and clean up the edges on these three panels. Now that that's done, I'm going to build the replacement structural panels. What I mean by that is the Panels that are going to fit onto these that have the replacement mounting systems and ventilation holes for fans and radiators. For the top panel and front panel, I want to use thick material. As I mentioned in part one of the build log, you can't really go any thicker than about two millimeters, even with aluminium, but any metal, otherwise it gets too heavy. So I'm going to use five millimeter acrylic. And that's going to allow me to build a bit of a bevel in around the edges, around the fans, and you know, some shape. But on the motherboard tray, the mid plate, I need the material to be as thin as possible. I don't want it sticking out, so I'm going to use 1.5 millimeter aluminum panel. The quickest and easiest way to measure out the acrylic for both the front panel and top panel is just to trace it out. Now I do actually have a bandsaw which is ideal for this kind of thing, but even though it's quite a high-end bandsaw, the neck is not big enough for big pieces like this, so I can't actually fit it in. So I still need to use the jigsaw. Now, as for the blade, I would not use a wood blade for cutting acrylic, mainly thick acrylic. You're better off using a fine tooth metal blade. It is slower, but it's a lot cleaner and safer. Otherwise you can end up cracking the acrylic quite easily. I obviously can't trace off this one, so I'm going to measure the size panel that we need. Now I could actually cover up that recess, but I think that's going to look nice around it. The thing is, if I come to this edge here, we only have, well, it's about 8 mil now to bolt onto. And with an M4, that leaves two mil either side, so it's just enough to 
to bolt on with M4s. I'm just checking if we have the clearance for the radiator, and we actually don't. The radiator is bigger than the size of this area that we've cut out overall, but as long as the ventilation holes that we're going to cut are smaller than this cut out here, then it's not going to be a problem because we have enough overhang here so that when we cut those ventilation holes, we're not going to you know, cut through the edge of our new cover panel. So let's see how we went with our measurements. Looks like we're going to have to curve the corners to match it up with where the recess starts. Yep, that's perfect. I know it looks completely out of place right now. That's mainly because of the difference in color, but also because this needs to be cleaned up. The edges need to be rounded slightly. For some of you, this is definitely going to be the boring part of the modding to watch because we're not doing anything flashy for aesthetics. We're just building the base for what is to come. When I make my videos, I'm thinking about the people who watch them for information, the people who may want to do this exact mod, which is why I go into a lot of detail. I know we haven't got very far yet, but I'm going to have to leave the mods there for this part of the build log. Otherwise, it's going to be way too long until my next video. But the next step for me now will be to start, well, to get out my templates and start building in the mounting holes and the ventilation into all three of these panels on the mid plate, the top panel and the front panel, because I'm still going to have radiator and fan mounting positions. They're just going to be a lot cleaner and they're going to be placed a little bit differently. It's time to take a look at some more of the amazing components that are going into this build. Let's take a closer look at the Gigabyte Z170X Gaming 7. Now the first thing that came to mind when looking at this motherboard is how clean the PCB is. I mean, I'm used to seeing PCBs a whole lot more crowded than this. Just take a look at all of the blank space. It's an amazing looking motherboard. The aesthetics, I mean, you know, the color scheme is good. I'd just prefer to see all black pretty much every time, but I do like the designs of the heat sinks, I like the you know extra cover over the audio components here, the rear IO shield cover, which we're seeing in a lot of motherboards now, and all of this lights up with RGB lighting, which can be controlled from within the OS. We have a readout here, you know, overclocking features, just plenty of features on this board. The connectivity is amazing. We have two Front panel, USB 3 here, lots of fan headers, three SATA Express and eight SATA ports, which is awesome. The usual front panel USB 2 and audio, removable and upgradable op amp, and also extra gain settings, which you can adjust on the motherboard. I love this feature. The stainless steel covers on the PCI Express slots just makes them so much stronger, improves the aesthetics. I mean, stainless steel, incredibly durable and hard material. You know, definitely for a, a water-cooled build, a lot of extra weight goes onto the slots. So this is a great feature if you're going to be water cooling. Two M.2 slots, which I love. I mean, that is something that just should be on well, certainly any board that I would choose for my own build, that is something that I would want. This is obviously socket 1151, Z170 chipset. Take a look at the power delivery. Looks like we have six phases there and another 
five up the top. Just a single eight pin to power the board. This motherboard also has a great looking rear I.O. We have PS2, six USB 3, one of them is 3.1. There's also a USB 3.1 type C port. Display port HDMI, two gigabit killer nicks and 7.1 surround with those amazing looking connectors. So I'm very impressed with this motherboard and it's an exciting board to be using in this build. I don't often get to use Gigabyte motherboards because most customers request Asus ROG. We have the Fractal Edison M 750 watt power supply. The first thing I did when I removed this power supply from the box was tear it apart as you can see. And the reason I've done this is because this is a partially modular power supply. Some of the cables are hardwired and I seriously don't understand why companies are still doing this on high end power supplies. When so many people are sleeving their cables now, you know, it just makes it a lot more difficult for us modders. But really all you need to do is open up the power supply casing, which only takes about 60 seconds. It does void your warranty though. And then you just need to make sure that you sleeve inside of the power supply casing. And when it's done, it does look incredibly clean, even cleaner than a fully modular power supply. Well, at least the hardwired cables do. But the problem is, that when you sleeve a cable it ends up being more than double the size so it no longer fits through the hole in the casing anymore and usually you have to go at it with a Dremel to expand the hole but interestingly enough this power supply has this nice little plastic sleeve you remove that it doubles the size of the hole so it's absolutely ideal for sleeving. When you run into some real problems with hard wired cables is when they're not long enough. The 24 pin turned out to be exactly the length that I needed and during this build log, I will take you through exactly how to get your cable lengths, the way I do it, the best and easiest way to do it. Just, you know, straightforward common sense. But the 8-pin EPS was not long enough, and so you can see that I've cut it off, and now I need to solder on new wires that are going to be long enough. And I actually wanted to do this anyway, because you can see the gauge of these wires. It's 20 gauge or something. It's way too thin. And the sleeving ends up looking way different to the rest of the sleeving. So I want 16 gauge matched all the way through. And I'd actually prefer to cut off the 24 pin as well so that they're all 16 gauge. Some of them are 16, some of them are 18. I've actually replaced the smaller gauges. And also the double wires I have soldered. And you can see this is one here. These usually go all the way through up to the connector on the other end and you end up with two wires in the one pin. Well, you can't have that when you're sleeving. You end up with a way thicker wire. So you just cut it off at the other end and bring it back inside the power supply casing and solder them together. It really cleans things up and there's about three of those in there. So still need to solder on the 8-pin EPS. The one I won't be using is the 8-pin, well, the PCIe which is hardwired, never be using that again because we only need two 8-pin PCIe for this build and we can run them both from the modular connections, which I definitely want to do because, you know, I want them both coming from the same place. It just looks a lot cleaner. So let's take a quick look at the specifications here. It is 80 plus gold and 750 watts, 62 amps from a single 12 volt rail. So, you know, great power supply, high quality, just nothing wrong with it. I just don't like the hardwired cables. But anyway, I'm going to go into that in more detail in the next part of the build log. The sleeving I've used is MDPCX and you can find all MDPCX products on the Singularity Computer Store as well as everything else you can imagine for cable sleeving, wire, pins, connectors, also cable combs. These are from Ice Mods. You'll also find these on the store. But that sums up this part of the build log. Thanks for watching. And remember that none of this would be possible without our patrons. And a big thank you to the sponsors for this build.